Hey, hey, everybody. Guess who's back? It's me, Christina, your host for this BioBlitz 2020. I mean, yeah, 2020, right? <laughs> Anywho. All right, so we're back on the beach because we're studying here for herpetology, right? Is that the, the name of it? This is Dr. Nicole Angeli. And yes, hello. And her, um, her assistant, Matt. <laughs> and we got Jen here too. All right, so um, as we get started, where are we gonna be heading first since we're on the beach? What kind of what kind of animals would we expect here along the shoreline? Yeah, the shoreline is a great intersection point of lots of different kinds of reptiles and amphibians. Um, first, we have sea turtles. This is a sea turtle nesting beach. Um, second, we're going to have reptiles up in the leaves, things like anoles. We might see iguanas. We just saw one when we arrived to the beach, so we're going to go look for that guy. Uh, and then we're going to see small leaf litter geckos. They're very tiny and they're going to be on the ground. Those are probably the things that we're going to see at this time of day. Um, at night, you may hear calls if you were on this beach or in this area coming from the forest. And those would be calls of things um, like Cuban tree frogs, white lipped frogs. Both of those are not from here, but they're a part of our habitat now. And also, um, Eleutherodactylus antilensis, which is the um, one of our local coquie frogs. Um, so we're gonna just take a walk and look for this iguana. Um, yes. And maybe we can have a conversation while we're walking. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. All right, everybody. Some of my tools with me. She's got tools. Yep, I have a couple of tools. I have. Um, sometimes I like to look at things more closely, like when I'm collecting, not for this bio blitz, but I usually carry a bag just so I. If I was needed to, I could look at an animal and put it in here and keep it nice and safe and cool, hanging it up somewhere. Oh. Um, I usually have my, my notebook. Mm -hmm. um, I like my notebook, but lately what I've been really using is my phone. <laughs> and I don't know um, if anyone in this Facebook Live has done this before, but um, you can download lots of different types of accounts to keep notes. And one that I use, and one that I think people have been using today, is called iNaturalist. It's um, through a partnership with, um, it was actually a research project that someone was working on. And it was such a good idea that National Geographic helped fund it, and the California Academy of Sciences. And now it's one of the best ways, if you don't know what you are looking at, and you don't have a textbook like what um, earlier during the plant talk that Mike Morgan had, he had his little book of plants. I also have my book <laughs> of Caribbean. That is not little. <laughs> for all the islands, and I usually travel with this when I'm going somewhere I don't know. But we don't need to do that anymore because it's 2020. <laughs> Instead, what we would do is we can just look at iNaturalist. iNaturalist uses fuzzy image recognition. So if I take a picture of something, like I'm not a plant expert, and maybe I don't know what this is. I know I don't. And so I would take a picture of it and then it would do a fuzzy image recognition and I could say, oh, that is, it just show me a picture, some information about it. And it will tell me what people around me crowdsourcing that data have also seen for them. So let's go try to do that with reptiles. Yeah, doing it. Off we go, y'all. Just gonna walk along this coastline right here. Now, earlier we saw the iguana over here, but he's gone. Yeah, we did. And so when I'm looking for reptiles or amphibians, what I'm usually doing, it's it, when you're looking for different types of animals, you look in different places. So if I'm gonna look for scarabacca, I would go where that leaf litter is back here, and I would be looking at my feet. Mm. If I'm looking for iguanas, I may be looking anywhere from the ground to the very top of the tree, and I'd be scanning. So I'd scan from the top to the bottom of the tree, to look for those iguanas. If I was looking for anoles, Anolus acutus is one of the species, is the only species of anole that we have here. And because it's the only species, it can live everywhere. So it lives on pieces of grass, on branches, on trunks of trees. Uh, there was a study that showed that two anoles lived on the same tree together for three years. So they love where they live and they are very specific to it, but you can see them everywhere. So I might be scanning for anoles as well. All right, cool. So right now, because we are, um, and then if we were looking, we don't have snakes here um, that are native. 
um, besides our blind snake. So that would be something that you'd have to maybe dig in the ground to find, or you'd mm. find in a pot, or by flipping cover boards. But um, what we, not here, um, but we do have some invasive snakes out west um, and through the middle of the island. And you may see those in all different kinds of places. Um, so, you know, when you're looking for amphibians and reptiles, um, you're kind of thinking about how the animal lives and then zoning in on the spot that you think that animal is going to be because it's going to make it more probable that you find it. Ah, okay, so knowing the environment. Oh, we got our plant guys. Hey, plants. <laughs> We're back. <laughs> All right, so shall we go see if we can yeah. find some, uh... Let's go find some herbs. Hey, and we're, herbs. we're on Facebook Live. Yeah, we're back on it again. Back on it again. Oh, yeah, we're going to go see if we can find some herbs. All right. Uh, all right, oh, look at us go. Okay. Wow. You know, the nice thing about being a herpetologist, uh -huh. and anyone can be a herpetologist, even if you're at home right now, you're a herpetologist because you're thinking about amphibians and reptiles. Hey! You know your transportation walking in to your office or school or a playground or the grocery store and seeing a knoll and think about it and take a picture of it and know where you found it and you're a herpetologist it's the coolest thing oh sweet so i could be a herpetologist you're a herpetologist today <laughs> polarized sunnies for you know when I'm out here on the beaches looking at the water sometimes though I flip them up on my head or put them down because sometimes it's hard to see these stir so the best way to find stir adapters and you can all do this is to start to move the leaf litter with your toe very slightly and just take slow slow steps okay I just saw one. Oh man Here. The thing with Sferodactylus leaf litter geckos is that they're very hard to find or to catch. And that's because they move so fast. So doing this, I'll never find it. But what I will do if I can keep looking in here, maybe I'll see it come out and sit on top of a leaf. So today we're not catching animals. If I was going to catch it for a scientific study, I would probably go, I know it's somewhere in here. I would put my hands all in here. I would lift, pick up all the leaf litter. I would put it into a bag and I would go one leaf at a time to mm. look for that Sferodactylus. But today we're just looking for them to take pictures and put them in our iNaturalist. So we're just going to walk around with our phones ready on camera mode. You can upload your photos after the fact um, oh. with iNaturalist. Cool. So I'm just going to walk around here, my camera at the ready. I think I just saw one over here. Oh my gosh. There's a lot of them. Like, so leaf litter geckos are interesting. Oh, there he goes! I saw him! Is it on camera? Uh, anybody else on Facebook Live see that? I totally saw it, but we might not be close enough. So, we just saw one go under here. Oops. We did. So... He was so tiny. Very tiny. Um, and so, actually, the... Sferodactylus um, of the Caribbean are some of the most interesting species in my um, in my opinion because they are so tiny. Some of them are the tiniest vertebrates in the places where they live. Oh wow! In the British Virgin Islands, there's a species from Sferodactylus parthenium that is the smallest Sferodactylus known, the smallest vertebrate on that island. Wow! They're also the densest. Huh. So they make up a huge amount of the biomass, and that's because lots of other things are eating them, okay. and because they're very prolific. So I even see Sferodactylus um, in my house in Estate Glen, um, just in the in the cover boards of my door, between the, my wall and my door. Huh. And I saw the tiniest one last night, mm -hmm. and I took a picture and put it on my office. So let's This is how you guys do it. Oh, oh. You got one? I saw him. He was just over here. Now we're looking, Christina. Did you have other questions? Oh, yes, I do. Um, So what is the, what are you really hoping to find? Like, what's something that, an animal that you really want to see today? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I think 
you know, I always like to go out and see the full complement of reptiles. We don't have a lot of reptiles on this island. And that's why the Caribbean is actually one of like the hotbeds of scientific research because you don't have so many species that you're overwhelmed. You can actually think about things scientifically. But for the purpose of the BioBlitz, I'd like to see a leaf litter gecko and a knoll, um, the iguanas, and maybe we see both species of Sparadactylus. I'm not sure how many, um, Jen is probably aware of how many are actually there, but there's two species on this island. So if we saw both species of uh, Sparadactylus by the end of the day and got them on iNaturalist, I'd be really happy with that. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so let's see. Um, so if you do happen to find like a lizard, oh, they might have found one, guys. <laughs> yes, they are very fast. I'm a herpetologist today, y'all. Um, I saw two so far, but they are so quick that, um, yeah, I lost them. I don't know what happened to them. Yeah. I'm sure y'all couldn't even see them either. Yeah, if you're not trying to catch them, it's hard to take a photo of them unless they're very slow. Um, oh. So, one of the things that we're not going to see today, which is too bad, is the St. Croix ground lizard. St. Croix ground lizard. You know, when you said, what do I hope to see? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes that question makes me sad because what I'd really like to see is the extinct snake that used to be on this island was a racer snake or a knophus sank tycrusus <laughs> and we don't say the last so I always have to remember what it's called mm -hmm. and then um, the St. Croix ground lizard followed oscalis um, polyps which is found just adjacent to Southgate um, up here uh, on Green Key Green Key with the first national wildlife refuge designated for a reptile in the country which is really special I mean, it's because it was one of the last two populations of St. Croix ground lizards um, over a hundred years between 1884 and 1968. They were declining and by 1968 completely gone from here. Oh my um, gosh. That's what I'd like to see here someday. So maybe the last BioBlitz was 10 years ago at Southgate. Mm -hmm. um, so this is 2020, maybe in 2030, maybe we'll have a completely different story to tell. Oh. Maybe that story will be that we see St. Croix ground lizards here. It's one of the sites that has been proposed by Fish and Wildlife Service um, where I work at the Division of Fish and Wildlife Service um, and also by our nonprofit partners like um, St. Croix Environmental Association. So you never know. You never know. Hope springs eternal and I think in this case we have a really good shot. Um, oh man. So if you guys are outside and you see some foliage like this, you know, be careful while you're stepping around. Just kind of do what she said. Oh, oh, that was a leaf in case anybody was wondering. That leaf jumped pretty high, <laughs> if I do say so myself. <laughs> Ooh, I have a question. Let's see. What are some of the... Oh, let me try. Oh, they're taking a picture of... I wish I could see more. It's not letting me see more. Uh -oh. Got it. <laughs> it's a science, y'all. So, um, let's see. I got a question from... Okay. Janai. Hope I said that right. Um, question, what are some of the species that you're looking for today that is also located in the BVIs? That is a good question. Oh, snap. Oh, 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 there he is, there he is, there he is. Camera, oh, oh, camera, oh, camera. Oh, oh, I think I got a photo. Okay. I think I got a photo, so I'm going to upload, I'm going to look through those photos and upload one of those. Um, so that's a great question because St. Croix is really unique in that it was made by two tectonic plates upwelling. And so we have this island that was never uh, attached to any other island. Puerto Rico the northern virgin islands st thomas st john water island and its keys and the bvi including anigata were all connected eight thousand years ago which on an evolutionary time scale is nada nothing so small that's like eating breakfast <laughs> in evolution time so or less so um we have a lot of really unique species in st croix um things like the st croix ground lizard 
or the skinks that would have been here or the racer. Um, and so there would have, there are still racer snakes in St. Thomas and drawn in the BVI. There are Virgin Island tree boas that are shared amongst that entire Puerto Rican bank. Um, there are also anoles um, that you would find. Um, three species of anoles are found on almost every island from Puerto Rico all the way up through Anigata. Um, and so that's anola stratulus, pulchellus, and um, cristatellus. And you'll see those almost everywhere you go. Um, the Sparadactylus macrolepis, it might be the only thing that we would find today that we might also find in the BVI. Oh, cool. So leaf litter gecko. Leaf, <laughs> leaf litter <laughs> gecko. Yeah, perfect. Also, they um, I have people saying that they saw the gecko when I found yes. it. They saw it jump. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey. Okay. Um. So Nicole, what's your favorite um herp? I guess what's your what's your favorite one? Yeah, the first time that I saw a glass frog. Um, and so that's oh. not from here. So is this from here or ever? Um, it could be both. How about one for each? Okay, so the first time I saw a glass frog, I and I did my master's thesis on Espera on a prosoblepon, a little green frog that is found through all the way from <laughs> Colombia through Central America. It, half of its stomach is completely translucent. You can see all of its organs. Oh. It goes in these like little hot spots along streams. So you hear all of them calling, looking for a female. What? The females climb on the tops of the trees looking for these groups of males. And this was, this blew my mind. That might have been <laughs> one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Um, and that's probably my favorite. Of all time. Of all okay, time. of all time. <laughs> Croy, I mean, I have a really soft spot for sparadactyls. Mm. I really, really like <laughs> I love that they're in my house. Um, I also like Eleutherodactylus lentis, which you wouldn't be hearing. Um, normally, they have a really, it's called that's the mute frog. frog. Okay, yeah, that's so, mute. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's called the mute frog here. Mute frog. Um, it's really mottled. It's really a beautiful color. Um, and you would find it on the ground in the leaf litter. I find them um, all over the island. And you don't hear them, though. You just see them. They're going to be about that big. Huh. Um, the tiny little frog. So that might be my, those are my two, two top favorites um, for St. Croix. Okay, right. okay. That's so, exciting. Uh, on that termite mound over there, there's a oh. bunch of anolas. Oh yeah, my gosh, that's a termite mound. To oh dear goodness. Wow. structure when you're out um, on a bio look for things like, um, Jen is a very accomplished herpetologist um, and mm -hmm. so, you know, is queuing in on all of these different things that we're finding, including um, all the anolas that are sitting on a termite mound. Okay. <laughs> that one just ran for it. Termites. Maybe I'll have, um, and I think you're doing an, art, uh, an insect talk later, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe we can get Sean to eat some, uh, some termites. Uh oh, did you drop something? <laughs> He's going to love that you said that. No, oh gosh. <laughs> Not it. Sean's going to eat termites. <laughs> she said so, it here. Anoles are too. Um, anoles love them too. Where did you see those anoles? They were right they on were... The... Oh, there's one on this side. Oh, okay. good luck. <laughs> right on the termite mound. So it's coming your way, Christina, actually, right oh. here on the bed. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, tree, that dude oh. just flew. So I'm going to get a picture of it. Oh, uh, let me. Anolis there he is. Anolis if you all can see him. Um, Anolis 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 Wow. Six. Wow. That's a lot. See them in your house. They might look big and green. Mm -hmm. It's always just brown with a white stripe on its back. Um, you may also commonly see some um, that are just one color, brown all over. Maybe they have oh. some stripes in their tail. What was that? That dog. dog. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that sounds big. <laughs> okay. Um, all right i can uh y'all i can remember the anolis acutus that's that's the only one i can remember 
Remember, I'm a I'm a new herpetologist today. Okay, Anola's the cutest. There we go. Right up on this um, tree here. The branch that's going up. It's light green. Um, yeah. Nope, I still uh, yeah no I don't see him. Um, <laughs> let me see. Um, okay, so if people come across like anoles and things like that, like. What advice do you have? Should they like leave them alone? Or should they? That's a great question. People are, um, you know, unsure of what to do when they see amphibians and reptiles here. I would say by far and large, leave them alone. This is their home and we have to share it with them. And they provide so many benefits. They eat lots, as we saw, these anoles are eating termites. Nobody wants termites in their home. Um, they eat um, moths, they eat, other um, types of ants. Mm -hmm. They eat, um, if we had St. Croix ground lizards here, um, or like the Amiva exel, the Puerto Rican ground lizard that's invasive that you would find in five corners and around the middle of the island. Um, we know that that eats centipedes. Um, they eat cockroaches. Um, and so do the anoles. Just leave these animals alone. Mm -hmm. um, if you have, um, if, if you're scared, um, the best thing to do is remove yourself from the situation. There we go. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Have a comment. I like to find cockroaches and feed them to lizards. Okay. Yeah. There you go. I actually once um, saw an anole eat a centipede literally right in front of my face. And I was like, thank you for your service. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and so that's good. That's really good. Um, just make sure we're not forcing animals to feed anything. Um, a big problem that we see um, maybe with people who not don't know um, is they try to feed um, things like sea turtles with different kinds of food um, oh. when they're in the water, or they may try and feed iguanas, lots of different types of um, things that just aren't very good for iguanas. So um, it's very cool to um, that cockroach Can is I a leave yummy it? treat, um, <laughs> and that's good, but just take care that you um, aren't harming wildlife when you're trying to interact with it. Oh yeah, there we go. Um, okay, so, Nicole, what piqued your interest in the science that we call herpetology? Well, I've always been interested in amphibians and reptiles. I've always enjoyed um, being outdoors. I wanted to be an explorer when I was a kid. <laughs> but we've explored a lot of the terrestrial Earth. Mm -hmm. Lots is unknown. Um, but I thought, how could I, how could I contribute some way? How could I make this world a better place? And I was like, well, I could use amphibians and reptiles as an indicator of landscape change and what kinds of habitats are healthy or not. Um, and so maybe that's not what I was feeling when I was five, when I wanted to be an explorer, <laughs> but when I was about 25 and looking for a career path, I, I just knew that what I wanted to do was make the world a better place. And I couldn't think of a better way to do it. There we go. Okay. That's awesome. Oh my gosh. Now, Nicole, this is, is this your first bio blitz ever? I, my first bio blitz was at Texas A&M. Oh. an amazing bio blitz team um, that is goes all over Brazos County. Um, I did my PhD at Texas A&M in a herpetology lab there. Um, but we looked for everything. So we would be on the, you know, we would be the herp experts. Um, but within our department, we had a mammal lab. We had a bird lab. And so we would all go on an insect lab, um, a parasite lab. So we all go out and do really, really fun projects. And unfortunately this year, because of COVID, we don't have lots of people. Right. Mm -hmm. We have so many people from Brazos County and Texas A&M um, sign up. So we'd always have huge groups and <laughs> we really find a lot of biodiversity. Um, copperheads, um, rattlesnakes, really, really fun. Oh my um, gosh. Herbs out there, so. That sounds awesome. Oh man. All right, well, um, let's see. I'm just gonna look around real quick. I think that's, hey, anybody in the, um, oh, yeah, I got a question, okay. How long have you been working in the herpetology field, Nicole? Oh, so I have been working specifically in herpetology for 12 years, and I, um, as a professional herpetologist. There we um, go. But I would say I'm a lifelong lover of herp. <laughs> I'm getting box turtles in my yard, um, in grandparents' yard in Pennsylvania to, um, even, you know, doing some animal husbandry when I was older and having little red ear sliders and things like that that are unfortunately invasive in our environment. Uh, so, um, yeah. But, yeah, I've always really loved herps. Thanks uh, for the question. Yeah. Anybody else have any more questions? While we are hanging out here, we're still uh, checking out the, the ground. 
what what would we be looking for next i guess i think we're gonna try and you know we already saw an iguana so i think we should try and document that we saw it mm -hmm. um there are really good ways to document so um st Croix environmental association on their website um stx environmental environmental.org mm -hmm. has a cool flora and fauna uh, checklist for the virgin islands has over 200 animals on it that you can look for um also we have free teaching activities um uh, at Arbordale Press, um, there's a book called The Lizard Lady that is about the St. Croix ground lizard. And in the in the teaching activities, they actually have um, guidelines for how to go out into nature and they even have an example like data sheet. So if you wanted to keep a record of everything at your house or on your way to school um, every day for the next year, you could have those data sheets available to you. Hey, there we go. All right. Well, I think for right now, that's that's all we got. Thank you, Dr. Nicole Angeli. <laughs> so yes. Tina Carter for being a great host. Oh. Stop it. Yes. Yes. Time for you to go off into the wilderness. Be free. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. That was the herpetology session, and we'll be seeing you again. Oh wait, I got I got one more question. Do we have? Do you, would you like to answer? Okay. So real quick, what advice do you have to young persons interested in the environmental studies and fields you'd suggest? Or um, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. So I think that. Oh. <laughs> My advice would be to be really open to opportunity. So even if you think that the only thing you want to study are, is, is a certain species of fish or a certain species of snake, be open to the bird project that you could volunteer for. Be open to getting experience because all of our methods are all of our methods in science. And we have some things that are specific to our taxa, but if you learn the basics, um, from someone who's on the ground volunteering um that's what i did i volunteered extensively i planted 1700 trees um <laughs> like i did all i counted all types of invasive plants in the chesapeake bay across four hectares for three months once oh my gosh like, just being a herpetologist isn't what defines me completely it's just what all of my experiences have culminated in so just be really open to experience and opportunity Hmm. That's a really, that's a good point. Yeah, because you learn things in different areas. Every area is going to have a skill that you could use towards wherever you are next, okay? So you guys heard it first. Volunteer in different areas to build your skill base. All right, we're going to sign off. Um, Madeline, nobody ate a termite, but we will catch you guys later. All right.